The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers from all walks of life, where it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved, or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you truly love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. This episode is brought to you by Kimes Ranch and Carrie Kelly Bits and Spurs. So I have been a fan of yours for a very long time. And so getting to prep for this interview was just like a normal day for me because that's the, the content that I'm already digesting, right? And so I re- really had a lot of fun and it just gave me a reason to di- dive even deeper into your work and, and what you have going. And I want to thank you and your, your team for sending NAR Country the new book that you're working on. And, and I don't know how much we can talk about that. We can talk about it. Okay, yeah. good deal. I've read February. Yeah, you'll be one of you're going to be one of the early conversations I've had. So I may trip over my tongue a couple of times, but oh, it's all good. Yeah, we could definitely talk about it. Sweet. Well, I've I plowed through about half of it, and I'm not a skier. And I know you were very adamant about that in the beginning about letting folks know if you know you're not a skier that there's going to be a lot of ski talk in there. But I truly have enjoyed it, and and just the journey that you went on through that man i think is so cool that you documented your own life experience and your own experiment i guess to kind of back up i guess your work over the last few decades so i want to back up i'm going to jump around a little bit if that not intentionally it's just the way my brain operates so i do want to hear here's an outline for folks listening i want to talk about stephen kotler the person the author the journalist and then, of course, your work that you've been doing for the past few decades as it relates to flow state and the human mind. And then, of course, Stephen Kotler, the writer. And so I may bounce around. And I think all of those are intertwined in some way. But if we can, Stephen, back up to whenever you were a kid, what was it that you wanted to be whenever you grew up? One, I don't think I wanted to be. I don't think I wanted to grow up. I'm not entirely sure that was, that was part of the plan. I wanted to be a writer. From a very early age, my grandmother, my grandmother was a poet, and I'm using that term very, very loosely. And let's charitably, she wrote what could be described as hallmark greeting cards, but it was poetry in a sense. And I wrote my first poem when I was four. I like ripped off something she was writing, which probably ripped off a hallmark thing, and like start. I literally started writing at four, and didn't really stop. So I always like I it didn't. The idea of actually that I was going to go do this, and maybe I can study this and all that. Like I had been, I had been writing so long. I remember when, by the time I got to college, and somebody was like, "Well, are you going to take creative writing courses?" And I was like, "Well, why would I do that? I'm already a writer." And mm-hmm. it didn't dot up, right? Like I, you know, of course I took those classes, and of course I, you know, I was just young and arrogant and didn't know what the hell I was talking about. But <laughs> yeah, I kind of always, I kind of always wanted to be a writer. That was for sure. In the beginning, like even when I started my career as a journalist, the question was, could I find a way to get paid to have adventures and write a novel? And that was, that was like the, that was the very first sort of puzzle. Like how, what job allows me to like write a novel and pays me to have adventures. Right. And that was, you know, in the early days what led me into journalism. In hindsight, I think you found it. Yeah, I, I definitely, I have made good on that promise to myself, I think. I had a feeling that was going to be the answer. Anybody that I have on the show, or really anybody just in general that is is doing what they do very well, they found that niche from a young age. And man, I'm so envious of that. And I get messages a lot like from people asking, like, well, how do I find my purpose? How do I, you know, how do I find that thing? And I don't have the answer for them. That comes from within. But for myself, like... And, and here, this will kind of be a segue into one of the questions I have for you. It's like, I grew up playing baseball, played all the way through college. And then whenever they didn't ask me to keep playing, meaning I didn't, I didn't get drafted right. or anything, yeah. that's over. That identity, all of that's gone. 
And it led me to this dark state. I didn't know it was depression at the time, but man, I was just trying to find my way. And I feel like a lot of folks listening to this may struggle with the same thing or any ex-athlete, even if they played on a professional level at some point, that's going to come to an end. We see it in the military. What's your advice to to those individuals and in like how yeah, to so, find that thing? So, okay, let me back up. Let me define a couple of terms and tell you a little bit about what I do now on, on this side of the coin, because otherwise everything I say is going to make a hell of a lot of sense. I am the founder of the Flow Research Collective, which is a neurobiology-based virgin training company. In other words, we study what goes on in the brain and the body when people are performing at their absolute best. And um, we do this work all over the world. We work in about 130 countries. And we do research with institutions like Stanford and UCLA and USC and and things like that, looking at, at the brain side of it. And then we take what we learn and train people, as I said, in like 130 countries. We work with everybody from branches of the military, we're training the Air Force right now, all the way through sort of C, C-suite executives, CEOs and whatnot, professional athletes, and then just, you know, mom and mom and dad in, in Iowa and things like that. So we right. work with huge swaths of folks. And this is a really common question. It's a, it's where I see it the most heavy is in people who are transitioning from a job in special forces back into the world and professional athletes. Those two seem to be very, very, very difficult, but the answer is the same. And the answer is if you're looking for the long version of it, you can find it in my book, the art of impossible. If you're looking for a shorter version, I wrote an article about it for Forbes called the passion recipe. And the idea here is sort of really simple. If you're trying to figure out like where do you go next, what's your passion, what's your purpose, you have to know that human beings are designed to have a purpose, biologically designed to have a purpose. And in the sense that we're designed to have a purpose, we're designed with a built-in way for that purpose to emerge. And if you're hunting a purpose, it starts with curiosity. Curiosity is the foundational human motivator. It's the most basic motivator we have. And... If you're looking through the purpose, the short answer is you first got to turn curiosity into passion. And the way to do that is you don't just look for one thing you're curious about. You look for, I like I, I tell people to start by making a list of like 10 to 20 things you're curious about and look for places they intersect mm-hmm. in really weird ways, right? So let's say you're interested in nutrition and you're also interested in football. First thing, you want to be as specific as possible. The brain has a built-in pattern recognition system. It finds links between things automatically. Does This is just what almost every neuron in the brain does. So if you can be as specific as possible, so football, too vague. The mechanics of playing left tackle, that's very specific. Mm. Nutrition, too vague. But alternative vegan meat sources as a new form of protein, right? Where those two things intersect, that's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because they intersect at a very specific spot. Like, could you play left tackle and be a vegan? That's an interesting, weird, weird question, right? You got to be 340 pounds to play left tackle. Can you do that? You know, eating vegan proteins, interesting, right? So, but what you're looking for is the intersection of three or four or five curiosities. Then you're really cooking. That's a lot of energy. And once you can find that, play there. And I mean, play there. Don't be in a rush. Go exploring, take a class, read a book, watch a movie, talk to some friends, go exploring, repeat, 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 right. let it emerge. This is a, in creativity studies, they talk about problem finding. And it's one of the secrets to creative problem solving. And this is, if you're trying to find your passion or a purpose, that's creative problem solving, right? So problem finding means don't rush to an answer. Just let shit percolate, right? Yeah. And you just play there for a while. But if you can find the intersection of four or five, and we can talk about the neurobiology, the neuroscience, why all this works, if you care. I'm just keeping things at like high level, what's actionable. Once you've sort of figured out what your passion is, which is basically like you figure out where the intersection of four or five curiosities are, and you're pretty close to your passion, right? Those are the, that's the seed kernel of passion thing where people screw this up all the time. And it's, it's really, it's easy to see why you do it. When, when I say, hey, you know, give me an ex- example of passion in basketball. And, and you, like, you think of like LeBron James in a windmill dunk a couple of years ago when they're in the finals. 
kind of thing with that gritty look on his face. And he's like, that's passion. And that is what passion looks like all grown up. That's right. not what passion looks like at the front end of passion. At the front end of passion, it looks like a little kid in the driveway with a basketball <laughs> trying to, you know, trying to get it to fall through a hoop. That's what the front end of passion looks like and feels like, right? Passion mm -hmm. is a verb. It's earned. So it's earned by spending time playing at the intersection of multiple periodicities. Once you've got that passion fire burning for a whole bunch of different neurobiological reasons, passion is a, is a great motivator. It's a lot more powerful than curiosity, but it's still a fairly selfish motivator. And what you want is to turn it into purpose, which brings other people into the picture. If I was going to put it like at a, in the neuroscience underneath um, passion is the neurochemical dopamine and the neurochemical norepinephrine. So if you've ever fallen in love, that crazy getting, I can't stop thinking about that person, that's norepinephrine and dopamine. That's what's underneath passion. It's like you, you crank up norepinephrine and dopamine more, right? Like bigger than passion. It's not good for you. Norepinephrine ends up becoming anxiety disorders and OCD and things like that. Too much dopamine leads to schizophrenia. But it, to get more motivation, you want social neurochemicals, other motivators that the brain produces like endorphins and serotonin and anandamide. So when you have a passion and you couple it to a problem that's greater than you, right? And you start working for the benefit of other people or the planet or animals or ecosystems, you take your pick, that starts to bring in these pro-social neurochemicals, you get more motivation. And that's the whole, the whole point of these things is you get motivation for free with passion and purpose and curiosity and that it's the big deal motivation is is so much of this game so that was a very long answer you asked a hard question and i'm sorry for talking for <laughs> no minutes, don't apologize but, i could just sit here and, and keep listening to you but yeah it's like as kids we don't we don't think about that we don't really think about the result or the outcome but as adults we live in this microwave society and we want to see instant results and I was thinking about this the other day that your book, The Art of Impossible, if I learned anything from that, it's that just that there are no shortcuts, you know, to be able to tap into flow, to be able to tap into into the, the power of that, like there is no shortcut to doing it. And I'm curious to hear your your answer to I think there's a monetary side to that, right? And that I that I think people get skewed or, you know, whenever they try to find their passion, they're also trying to find a way to make money at that thing. What would your answer be in response to that? So when I think of a passion, I think of something that you're going to do no matter what. Doesn't you pay me, don't pay me, I don't care. I'm still going to do it. So I always say, like, how do you know the real writers from fake writers? Honest to God, there's two, there's two answers to this question as far as I can tell. Are the real artists from the fake artists? The real artists, when they finish a project, be it a painting or a book or a, a film, and it gets released to the public, they don't care. They're already <laughs> on to the next thing. They want the thing to do well, but they're on to they're, they're interested. They're already working on their next project. Creatives are all about the actual art act of being creative. That's the, that's the rush. People who are in it for other reasons, and I'm not saying bad or good, I'm not judging, but people who are in it for other reasons than just the pure creativity, they care about the reaction. What does the public think of this thing that I made? But I, you know, with artists who are creatives like myself, the writing is where I run when I need a place to run. Mm. You write when I'm torn up inside and I can't think and I, you know, everything is crushing me. I run to the writing and those two qualities, when the thing is your salvation and when you would do it, if they didn't pay you, you just do it because it's who you are. That's what defines a passion for me. Now, that said, that was a that was a big, big long speech on passion. That said, we know from you know a lot of adult development theory uh, and a lot of kind of a lot of psychology, basically, that by the time you're in your thirties, you have to sort of start to solve the problem of what's known as match fit or match quality, which is. There's a link between how I make my living in the world and the things I do at my time and my strengths and my values and my passion and my purpose and all that stuff. And if you don't really have that completely worked out by around age 40, it starts to cause actual adult development problems in your life, 
So you get you get a really long sort of swatch of time to solve it, but there's there's sort of penalties, and this is something that's not like covered in our country, sort of with a lot of skiing, right? <laughs> and by the way, so in our country, for everybody listening, is a book about peak performance aging, and it has a lot of skiing in it for a couple of reasons. But one, I wanted to circle back to something you said because it's one of the reasons that I wrote in our country the way I wrote it is so people could see what hard work sort of looks like, then there's, you said there's no shortcuts. There's a flip side to that, right? There's no shortcuts, but the flip side is that hard work works mm-hmm. and it works like compound interest. So it's yeah. slow. It's a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, a little bit the next day, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the hardest thing. I mean, I've been teaching this stuff for 25 years. I've taught, you know, for over a half a million people, I would guess at this point. And the hardest thing to teach folks is like, hey, hard work works and it works like compound interest. And so you have to just show up and do the checklist of tasks that like fall under the rubric of peak performance every day for a very long time. And you see results very early on. Anybody who's played with like, you know, some of the peak performance ideas knows this. You get results very quickly, but it gets shocking after a year or two or three. And that's yeah. when it gets really fun, right? And that's, I mean, what's shocking is meaning like you just keep waking up going, holy shit, I had no idea I was capable of this. Yeah. Holy shit, I had no idea, right? And that's the ride. That's the most fun. Yeah. I read a quote, I think yesterday by Rumi, it says, as you walk on the way, the way appears. And that's so true. Like you you just keep showing up and, and opportunities present themselves. And like you're saying, it, those opportunities begin to compound just by showing up. I feel like with a focused intent, good shit's going to happen. At least in my experience, that's what's happened. So I, yeah, I, I very much agree with you. I've always said, and you know, this is the thing I said at the end of Art Impossible, but if you go through the entire biology of human peak performance, there's six seven, depending on, on how stressed art you are, things to do every day, and about seven more things to do every week. That's it. And peak performance is literally a checklist. It's doing those things Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, repeat over and over and over again. And that's like, there's no secret. There's just, and we're all wired this way. This is what these seven things or 14 things are biological. So this is everybody. It's not, it's not actually individual. That's the, the cool thing about working about the, on the neurobiology is you get below like the squishy subjective psychology where you have massive individual differences for me. And those usually can impact peak performance. For example, like where your risk tolerance is, right? That's very individual and usually affects how, I'm, how I could train you in, in peak performance. But you get one level down to the neurobiology, and it's the same for everyone. It was shaped by everyone, evolution, and shared by everyone, which is cool. Mm-hmm. I don't remember where I read it, but somewhere, it may have been an interview, it says that Stephen Kotler has published over 5 million words. Not only the author of 14 books, 10 of which are, are bestsellers, four on the New York Times bestsellers list. So I think that goes along with what you're saying. You show up for decades, and... You're very focused on what you're doing. I got to tell you something. On the writing tip, though, I had so I I would I had the benefit of a a great teacher. So when I was in grad school, I studied under this guy named Stephen Dixon. You've not heard his name. He's a novelist. He won the National Book Award for a book called Frog. But he has the distinction of being the most published author in the history of the world. Like he's he's literally published more stories, books, articles, whatever than Andy Alice Chekhov. I guess had the record before him. And Chekhov's record was like 240 something. And Stephen Dixon, and this was years ago, had already published over 600 different works. It was a, it was sort of an amazing career. And I remember I asked him, I was like, dude, what is the secret? And this guy, he had a, he had a challenging life. He had a very, he was deeply devoted to his wife, loved his wife. She was very sick, very in a wheelchair. So there was a lot of like, You know, he had a full workload as as a college professor and had a very, very sick wife that he was taking care of and still, like, managed to set this record. So you you beg the question, right? Like, how the hell are you doing this? And Mm -hmm. and I said, Stephen, how do you do this? He said, it's really simple, man. I write a page a day and then I edit what I wrote the day before. So it's clean. And that's what I do every day. And if you do that for 365 days in a row, you've probably got a book. Mm. 365 pages. And I went, oh, 
Shut up. What he didn't tell me was my first goddamn book was going to take 11 years to write. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, he didn't tell me that. Like, he didn't tell me about the part where you're going to throw it in the trash four times yeah. and start over. He didn't mention that. But he was damn good advice about, like, getting the shit done. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I was going to, I was going there next. So like out of those 10 bestsellers, the 14 books, I guess now 15, how many of those have we not seen? Like how many of those are still sitting in a closet seen. somewhere? So uh, two novels. So I started out as a novelist. My first book is a novel. And then I wrote two more books, two more novels, neither of which got published. One of which I'm looking at the finding. I think I have two more novels and a screenplay that I've never that's never been made. Mm. Uh, a couple other things, and then and then I switched to nonfiction, and it and it really started to click for me. And I went back to fiction five years ago just because I, you know, felt like I had some unfinished business there, and I still think I have unfinished business there. Yeah, there's so there's a couple of books sitting in drawers. There's a and there's by the way. So with novels, you write the whole book and then you try to sell it. Mm-hmm. With nonfiction books, you write a proposal. Proposals are a beast. They could take, that's like six months, a year. I mean, like to write a really great proposal could take a very long time. And I wrote, after those two books got turned down, I sold a book, did it, and then I, then I got stuck. And I, I think I wrote two or three proposals that all got rejected before I managed to sell my third book. So yeah, there was a lot of like, that's what I mean by like, you gotta be willing to do it. If, you know what I mean? If you're not going to get paid, I, I was so poor for so long, but I was really, really not giving up. Yeah. That reminds me of, I interviewed Stephen Pressfield, I think last year sometime. I don't know if you're familiar with his work or yeah, not, but the, the art of war and the, yeah, or the turning the pro war, and then the war, war of art along with a number of others, but same thing. Like he, he wrote for decades before he earned a check, you know, I got to tell you something. I, I was sitting in a I was at Singularity University right when they sort of opened it. It's a university in Silicon Valley devoted to using accelerating technology to solve global challenges. It's a graduate university. And uh, I was there listening to a NASA astronaut talk about, and, and one of the world's leading roboticists, talk about his journey. I was listening to that. I would, Peter Diamandis, who founded Singularity University, founded the X Prize, which was a private race in space that you know sort of helped build the private space industry we were writing a book together and i was interviewing peter about his life story just so i could integrate it into the book and his life story was you know as ridiculous as as you know getting his ass kicked a billion and a half times on the way to success and i remember listening to dan barry give this lecture that the nasa astronaut and he talked about getting rejected from nasa i think 18 times like 18 years in a row or something like that some ridiculous ass kicking and then and it went on from there and i remember sitting there thinking you know what i think this is everybody's story mm-hmm. that everybody who's successful this is the story there's i was gonna no, say anybody that no, you've heard about there's, yeah. there's no other story and i think that's just because the other thing that i think is more challenging and more difficult i don't know because it wasn't my experience but i think people who have like the first thing they make the first movie there and the first book they write and becomes a giant success I say this. Uh, I, I know that the hardest people to train in peak performance are the people who had an easy time in high school. Mm. If you were financially comfortable, super popular, pretty, and a good athlete in high school, and like and really enjoyed the experience, mm-hmm. it is difficult for you afterwards. I can see that, and, and it's difficult to tra- like the, like in training people in peak performance. Those folks have a rough time of it because. It's very hard to develop grit, that much grit later in adulthood. It's easier to develop, to get really gritty young before you know any better. Right. What, this is a Tim Ferriss question, but do you have a favorite failure, or fa- you know, a challenge that you overcame? And at the time, man, it was just devastating. But in looking back, like you had to go through that failure and you develop character and well, what, uh, I mean, shaped who you decade. are. It is heavy. Pick a decade. So things you may or may not know about me, I've broken 87 bones. <laughs> I was told I was never going to walk again at one point. I spent mm-hmm. three years in bed with Lyme disease. So I've, they're all and, – and what I always tell people with this stuff is – I mean, Lyme disease is a good example. I tend to think of these like 
colossal. And Lyme disease took everything. Like I lost a job I spent 10 years trying to get. I bankrupted myself trying to like heal the disease. I uh, love the woman, lost the woman who was going to marry me, you know, all of it to those three years. But then yet, I will tell you that it was, I think of the disease is like, my joke is it's a teleportation chamber because the shortest distance between two points isn't a straight line. It's actually teleportation. <laughs> and I got sick with Lyme disease as one, and what, as one guy. But when you get your ass kicked for three years and you're in bed for three years and you actually find a way to pull out of it, all the bullshit drops away, right? Yeah, you're like, okay, yeah. right? Like, okay, this could go away in a heartbeat second. So like, I don't want anybody in my life who like, I don't love and I don't, and I'm not thrilled to work with. You know what I mean? Like right. all those, I don't want to do anything that like, so, and it like, that was a, the, the other side of that was, was a much braver version of me that I don't think I would have gotten to on my, you know, on my own. I, it took like, it, and everything that I, that I am in the world was on the other side of Lyme disease. Like, mm. All of my research sort of really caught fire there. You know, everything really began there. And so I think of the disease and that as a teleportation chamber. I went in once, one person, you know, and I came out someplace else and it was literally the shortest distance between two points. If I would have tried to live my way into this new version of myself, it would have taken 20 years. Mm -hmm. But you know, put me in a cauldron for three years and, and I came out the other end, somebody I wanted to be. Right. I have read the, those stories and, it was you getting on that surfboard and, and feeling flow. Was that for the first time? Is that what led you down the road to the research that you're doing today? So it's a, no, there's, a, there's twin stories here. So I came into journalism in the early 90s, right? And in my early 20s. And I was super interested already in sort of like how humans work and like the neuro and neuroscience, really. Well, in the 90s, the behavioral neuroscience was becoming a thing. So for the first time, it wasn't just like, what is this individual neuron doing in the brain? It was, hey, we think we know why people are acting the way they're acting. You know what I mean? Suddenly I was interested because I was fascinated by that stuff. And simultaneously, I was obsessed with action sports. And I spent the 90s chasing professional action adventure athletes around mountains and across oceans. That's how I ended up breaking so many bones because if you're not a professional athlete and you chase crows around mountains <laughs> across oceans, you can break some stuff. You know, I, and I broke a lot of stuff. But if you know anything about the 90s in action sports, it's often referred to as the era of impossible. Yeah. Where more so-called impossible feats than ever before got done, right? Like over and over and over and over again. And this was in surfing and skiing and rock climbing and snowboarding and the like. And I had a front row seat and it was it was the most astounding thing you'd ever see. Nothing. I mean, none of it made sense. Going into the 90s, 25 feet was the biggest wave anybody had ever surfed. And above that was impossible and you would die and it's not, it's never going to happen. And we came out of the 90s and people are towing into waves that are 100 feet tall. Right. What the hell happened? <laughs> right. Like you go into the 90s, <laughs> nobody can throw a single backflip on a motorcycle because the aerodynamics are so crazy. It's never been done. It's never going to get done. And you come out of the decade. And people are throwing doubles with like midair heel clicks between the two, right? Like right. what is going on? And it's everywhere. And I always say it is really one thing when you like see it on a big screen and you're like, there's Laird Hamilton serving a hundred foot wave. Like, I don't get that. What the hell? It's a totally different thing when you're living in these communities and these are your friends and you go drinking with a group of guys on Friday night, and, you know, and then you wake up hungover. Saturday morning and everybody goes into the back country and then one of your friends does something that for all of reported history has never been done and is not supposed to be possible. Yeah. That's a very different thing to see. And what really caught my attention, where what really had me is I knew enough about peak performance at that point to go, okay, a lot of this is I thought was genetics and a lot of this is like good childhood and you know, a lot of that stuff. And none of the people I knew fit those criteria. They like they all had terrible childhoods. They came from broken, fucked up homes. Mm -hmm. they Not a lot of money, right? Not a lot of education, a lot of risk taking, a lot of substances. Normally you put those things in, together in a community, people die young or go to jail. What they don't do is reinvent what's possible for the human species. Right. So I'm talking to all these athletes trying to figure out what's going on. And we don't have, none of the athletes at this point have the word flow. Flow, by the way, if, if you're listening to this, you don't know what flow is. It's an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. It's any of those moments, rapt attention, total absorption, get so sucked into what you're doing, 
everything else just seems to vanish and all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. That's flow. And when talking to these athletes, they kept talking about flow. They kept saying, well, this, when I'm, when I'm performing at best, I'm in the zone. And, you know, and then they would, they would, they would say various things about it. It was the only commonality among all their stories. Everybody had a different background. Everybody, this was the same thing that was showing up everywhere. Then I got Lyme disease and got really sick. And as you pointed out, I did, I got dragged to the ocean in the middle after three years in bed at, at, at a point that I could barely walk and couldn't think. And like, I got dragged to the ocean by a friend who just like showed up my house and wouldn't leave. Like she, we were going <laughs> surfing or I, right? Like she was like, you have been in the house for three fucking years. And I like, it'd been five years since I've been surfing. I did not want to do this, but she was not leaving. And you know, we went to the, like the, wimpiest beginner break in the world and they gave me a giant board and they had to literally like carry me out to the fucking break but i was on the board and a wave came and i got toddled into it and i popped my feet and it was like muscle memory and that was literally all the energy i think i had in the world was to get to my feet on that wave mm-hmm. and i just popped up into this crazy other dimension and i had been in flow before but i had never been in so at the far edge of, the, of what's known as a macro flow state you get all the so-called you know, mystical effects. You can have out of body experiences. You feel one with everything. And we know neurobiologically why all these things happen now, but we didn't back then when that this was happening to me, by the way. And, you know, so I popped up and I was like, what the hell is going on? This is amazing. And the craziest thing about it was like, I felt great. My brain was clear. There was no pain in my body. For three years, I had been so crippled. I couldn't walk. So then there was no pain in my body. I could even surf a little. You know, and I caught like four or five waves that day. And then they, like, I was done. They took me home and put me into bed. Nobody moved me for 14 days because yeah. I just couldn't walk. And, <laughs> you know, over the, oh, and then I went back to the ocean on the 15th day. I could walk again and I literally knocked on my neighbor's door. And I was like, you got to drive to the ocean. I want to go surfing. <laughs> and he was like, man, okay, sure. But over about eight months when the only thing I was doing different in my life was surfing and having these really quite crazy, like quasi mystical experiences. I went from about 10% functional to about 80% functional. You know, the first question is, what the hell is going on? Flow is not a known cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. So, like, how is that possible? And once I started solving that puzzle, I started to realize that the exact same state of consciousness that, that got me from seriously subpar back to normal was taking all these normal people, the athletes I was I knew before, all the way up to Superman. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of, you know, the beginning of a, what has become a lifelong obsession. Man, I'm, I want to go so many different directions. While we're on that, let, will you talk a little bit about like the power of the human mind and we're talking about the mystical. I'm curious to hear your opinion on manifestations and the metaphysical world that we live in and just the power of belief. You know, you talk about these guys who where their background doesn't match what they're doing they're proving the impossible but that had to that came from somewhere you know you're talking about laird hamilton surfing 100 foot waves like he had to think about that before it actually happened what are your thoughts around that because we hear a lot of gurus out there today and they're making a shitload of money on promoting a lot of things but i'm curious to hear from you because you have done the research i don't yeah let's i Mm -hmm. run a neuroscience research institute so i don't i am not qualified to say anything about, about, about the spiritual side, but I, let me pause and, and say a couple of things now that I've said I'm not qualified to say anything. My <laughs> first real great mentor in neuroscience was a guy named Dr. Andrew Newberg. And Andrew Newberg was the guy, so oneness with everything, right? Which is a very common experience in flow and in this experiences. He's the reason we know why it happens in the brain. And it, because he was the first neuroscientist to literally partner with Tibetan Buddhists and Franciscan nuns who both in meditation experience a state of oneness with everything and say, hey, can you like meditate in the brain scanner? Can we work together? Can we see if we can figure this out? And what Andy always told me is, hey, none of our, no, none of what we do says anything about the bigger why questions. We just work on how. The bigger, that's, that's somebody else's department. And I agree, but all these great breakthroughs in my field have come with partnerships across like the spiritual divide, right? When scientists team up with people on the spiritual side of the conversation, that's real progress has been made. And so I've gone out of my way to sort of bridge my, a gap into spiritual communities 
because I think there's really great stuff that comes out of it, but I don't, I'm not qualified to talk about the metaphysics of it. But here's what I can say from the peak performance standpoint, because this is, this we do know. So affirmations, which sort of tend to underpin what most people think of as manifestation, tend not to work from a peak, from a peak performance perspective. And gratitude, on the other hand, works exceptionally well. So why is that? One of the reasons is because the brain has a great big <laughs> and when you're looking in the mirror going, I am a millionaire, I am a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, and the brain is going, shut up, man, you work at Walmart. Right. You ain't no millionaire, right? Like that's demotivating. It actually crushes you inside. What but if, if you're you at, what if your actions what, match your affirmations? So does that change that, well, the game? That, let me let me give you the gratitude side, and let me try to back into an answer to your question because I don't know. Maybe, maybe is what I would say. So gratitude does work. On the other hand, and the reason it works is when you like, I'm so happy and grateful that my legs work today. That's true. And what happens is if you start, if you really, if you run a gratitude practice, which is like list ten things that you're grateful for, but like list each one three times out loud, write it down, and really feel it. What the brain starts to do is go, oh, look, there's all this good stuff going on in your life. Maybe you're a little safer than we thought you were. And anxiety decreases. And people who have a regular gratitude practice have more flow in their lives. They're more flow prone. And this is work we did with Dr. Glenn Fox at USC than others. Mm -hmm. So gratitude does work. So what you asked is if your actions sort of line up with your affirmations. There is a lot to be said for staying. For what now? Right. Fake it, you make it. Uh-huh. Right. Like, you know, I, I had to stand on a lot of stages and give a lot of talks before I started to believe I was a guy who belonged on stage giving a talk about anything that Amy should listen to. Right. Mm. Like, and that's not unusual for so, me. That's, well, that's, you would call that imposter syndrome. You felt the effects yeah. of that. I, everybody feels the effects of imposter yep. syndrome. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, that's a, that's a sort of a normal part of the process. Mm-hmm. If you don't feel that way, actually, I would say, Hey, you might have a touch of narcissism disorder or maybe <laughs> some psychopath. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, there's, an, there's like, there's a certain, there's gotta be that voice in your head. You know, there's always the voice in my head that's like, dude, you are a punk rock kid from Cleveland, Ohio, and you're opening for Obama. Like, what the fuck is, you know what I mean? Like, wh- how does that happen? Like, uh, y- yes, there's 25,000 people in an auditorium, but I'm like a punk rock kid in blue and all that. Like, that's, yeah. so, you know, and that doesn't, you know, that's not going to change. And, I, and I'm glad it doesn't change. You know what I mean? That's what allows me to, like, stand on stage and still relate to everybody in the audience. When you stand on stage and start thinking that you, you're the guy who has to be there, then mm. I get nervous. <laughs> I, I agree with you, man. Whenever I, I tapped into gratitude practices and truly started to feel that, you know, feel the emotion of gratitude, it's like a fucking superpower. It, it shifts that internal story. Uh, you start to see more opportunities. And I want to talk about something because I want to go back to what you said because you said something really important and I, and I left it there. So one of the things you said is I've done a lot of work, especially lately in my work around peak performance aging, around authenticity. Mm-hmm. Authenticity is really becoming more of more of a very important concept. Again, it's a motivation thing. So authenticity is a tight alignment between your values and your actions. And it's a verb, right? There is no authentic you or authentic self, because the self isn't one thing. We're always evolving. Right. Right. So that so authenticity is a way of being. It's an action. It's a verb, right? There's just so when we act authentically, we get a huge boost in motivation. And we also get a lot of really good sort of psychological benefits and immunological benefits. A lot of the really, this is one of the things that happened to me in Lyme. So a lot of our really positive emotions, authenticity being one of them flow, cause the immune system to produce more T cells and killer T cells and NK cells. And these are all the cells that fight disease. So one of the reasons there's, a, there's sort of a tight coupling between flow and and health benefits is because of this so correct me if i'm wrong but mihai chink sent me high would you say the the godfather of flow definitely the godfather of flow psychology flow psychology 
What would you say the biggest impact he's had on your career? I don't think there's any think there's any way to explain the impact he's had on my career. Because he was um, doing this what back in the fifties, sixties, like long he before. Started in the, yeah, he started in the sixties. Sixties. Um, you know, he he was always very nice to me. Also, is the other thing. Mike was a very good man, or at least to me, he was. But everybody, everybody I know who worked with him loved him. He was hugely influential in our country. My peak performance aging book, for example, this is a crazy story. So Mike, the first time we talked, he asked me to call him Mike. So instead of me, I'm Mike. Called him up. This is pre-COVID. He had had a stroke. He was in his 80s. And I had, they had been translated a bunch of his older articles and interviews out of Italian and put him, they were in a new textbook. I was reading some of them. And he had always sort of, he had, been an avid outdoorsman. He had a place in Montana. He was always hiking. Students like to tell stories of how he'd come back from like a weekend away rock climbing or mountaineering and like bruises on his face. Like he was a serious outdoors guy. And he sort of always underplayed it. But I was reading this one interview and he was naming old school 60s Yosemite climbers, like hardcore, hardcore folks Mm -hmm. that you would like only like you know what I mean? Like only a diehard rock climber from back in the day would know. And I called him up and I was like, Mike, I know you like you have this story on your TED talk where you say you first discovered flow in a concentration camp. And I know your early studies on flow were on artists. But tell me the truth, man. You were an action sport athlete. You were much more serious about this stuff than you let on. You were getting into flow in the mountains and you didn't know how to explain it. And that was way too weird for the science community at the time. So you decided you were going to work on artists and creativity. And there's this huge pause, like two minute pause. And all I'm sitting on the other end thinking, Oh my God, I've totally offended him. What the, Oh shit. Right. And finally he says, I don't know her. Now my brain is like, Oh shit. Is the stroke affecting his brain? What did he say again? You got to be careful. Yeah. And I was like, and so after like a minute, I was like, well, what do you mean I have to be careful, Mike? Right? And he's like, you do something your whole life for flow. Then you get to be my age. Forget about climbing mountains. Some days I can barely get out of bed. You need a backup plan. You got to be careful. And it was literally, this is the last conversation I ever had with him. He passed away a year after that. And we never we, we never spoke again. Though interestingly, he spent twenty years developing a, a flow for leaders company that uh, he actually merged with my company right before he passed away. So we were actually going to get to work together, and and then he passed away. So that oh, man. that was a, that was a real shame. In our country, which is my book on peak performance aging, that was my backup plan. The whole mm-hmm. thing happened because Mike said get a backup plan. And I was like, oh, no shit. shit, this is like this is like one flow. Tra- he wasn't like. You know, mentor, professor. He was this is one flow junkie to another. It was one action sports flow junkie talking to another, saying, "Be careful, have a backup plan." And it was, you know, great advice. And it ended up, you know, a, a book came out. I mean, you, I like a book came out of it. I can't tell you just how much stuff came out of Mike's work, and still hugely influential. I'm still reading and rereading his books. Yeah, same. The book called Flow In, and another one, Creativity, are, are two of my favorites. I want to quote something from Nor Country. I love how calculated you were with this project. You say, whenever I ski, I try to leave everything on the hill. I want to ski till I drop every time I get a chance. Why? Because life is short and I did the math. So you went through and you calculated how many, you know, possible yeah, ski the, seasons. I call, it, I call it the brutal math. I love that, I man. It. Yeah, so I use it. So we use this as a peak performance exercise, actually. And it's a great... So this is a phenomenal time management slash life management exercise. So it started with what you're talking about. Somebody was having a conversation about the best feelings on earth that were available. And in the conference, this is not that unusual of a conversation because in studies, flow always tops the lists of people's favorite experiences on the planet, right? Mm-hmm. So these are conversations that, that, you know, things I end up thinking about and um, so he was like, well, what are your 10 best like feelings you get on the planet? Like the activities and, and the feeling. And I was like, well, you know, number one is powder skiing. And then I stopped and I realized that like those great powder days only occur about seven times a year. I was 50 years old at the time I did this. And those days come only show up about seven times a year. 
And actuarial tables tell me, if I'm lucky, I'm going to live to be 80. Now, I've got a bunch of crazy friends working on like whiz-bang regenerative medicine technology and longevity technologies. And so let's say, you know, I get really lucky and I live another 10 years. And so I've got 40 more years left on this ride. Well, 40 times seven, right? The best I get to feel on the planet is 280. That's not a very big number, right? 280 times to feel the very best I get to feel on the planet. Mm -hmm. And and that's it. Like then then I'm done, right? (laughs) I was like, holy, I like I made a big ass calendar and hung it on the wall one. So I could like cross off the days and be really aware of it. But I also started to realize that like, you know, there were other items on my top 10 list. And so I ended up making a list of my top 10 best feelings on earth. And a bunch of them, like if you're brutally honest and really doing, doing that kind of thing, I, I surprised myself on a bunch of them. Like really, I was like things that I didn't think would end up on the list ended up on the list. And what we tell people now is in the interest of time management, don't do anything that's not top 10 on your list. Mm. Right. Like, why would you waste precious, valuable time on like the 17th best feeling in the world when one to 10 is available? And it, we tend to do this. We do this in, the, in our country in our peak performance aging training with people. We just have them run this exercise for two months during the training. There's a bunch of science underneath it, but like the, the short version is um, it has a huge impact on gratitude, first of all, because you're, every time you're doing one of those activities, you're sort of aware of what you're doing and you're, you're sort of lucky, aware that you're lucky to be doing it. Right. So there's a lot. It increases gratitude a lot. It increases conscious awareness and appreciation a lot. And quality of life is a very big impact. It's a very sort of deliberate way of, of living. And it has a very big impact on our mood and our psychology over time. Right. I got a couple more. I know you got to gotta get out of here. But I, man, I could just keep going, Stephen. I'm, it's such a pleasure to chat with you, man. How do you balance? So the center of anxiety and boredom, You'll somewhere in there, you'll find flow. But how do you balance that? Like as an ambitious person, how do you balance or find the balance between the anxieties, like wanting to do something very well and, and, and perform at your peak level, right? To continue leveling up and then like the boredom side of it. How do you find that balance? Well, so what you're referring to is flow states have triggers. You want more flow in your life? You can have more flow in your life. The triggers are preconditions that lead to more flow. Simple version is low power focus. So that's really what all the triggers do. They help drive our attention into the right here, into the right now, on the present moment, on the task at hand. And they do it a bunch of different ways in the brain, but like that's how they all work. And the most famous of these triggers is what's known as the challenge skills balance. And the idea here is that flow follows focus and we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap. Mm-hmm. If I were to put that emotionally, as you, which is where you started, right? Flow shows up sort of on the midpoint between boredom. There's not enough stimulation here. I'm not paying attention. And anxiety, whoa, way too much. I'm paying too much attention. And we can do this spot with the I nickname the flow channel. So, as a general rule, in terms of like the anxiety, I just get up every day and I try to push on my skills as hard as I can, right? Like, Mm -hmm. and it's not really as hard as you can because a bunch of years ago, actually, before he died, uh, she sent me, I sat down with a Google mathematician and they tried to put a number on this challenge skills ratio and they came up with 4%. Now it's, it was a back of the envelope calculation that we took from them and ran a couple years worth of research on. And it, it, it looked as close to accurate as we could get, but we didn't do good studies on it. So the anecdote at best, but the thing about 4% that's important is it's just slightly outside your comfort zone. Hmm. Really, it's so if you're shy, if you're meek, if you're timid, yeah, you're going to be scared because you're going to be a little outside your comfort zone. But for like hard charging type A types, you oftentimes have to dial yourself back. So, like, the challenge that you're actually facing is just slightly outside your comfort zone. Right. So, my point is that, like, that's what I try to do in everything I do every day push four to ten percent hard like that's that's why the compound interest matters right because you're mm-hmm. only it's only a, but it's it's the consistent right alex honald wants when he would rise we were having a conversation the, the climber yeah the free solo guy yeah, 
and this was before he had done uh, El Cap. Hmm. He was training, he was starting to train for it, but he had done half dome. And we were talking about the challenge skills balance in this 4% number. And he said, you know, he said, it's funny. He's like, Stephen, people ask me all the time, how do you do something like impossible, like free solo half dome? And I was like, he's like, the answer is sort of like 4% plus 4% plus 4% day after day, week after week, year after year. That's mm-hmm. the answer. Like that, that's how you do it. And I was like, okay, thank you very much. I'm going to be telling that story a lot. Because, you know, <laughs> That's cool um, to hear. Yeah, it was. And, you know, so it's, it's that. And when it comes to, like, the boredom, to me, I'm an avid reader. Like, it's very hard for me to be bored, like, if I've got the outdoors and I've got books. With those two things, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm, if I'm bored, it's because I'm making a choice. Right. And I agree with you. I'm more on the full yeah. throttle on the anxiety side of, man, I'm not doing enough. I need to be doing more. The other thing is this, though. So, and I talk about this in Art of Impossible. One, another quote to agree, clear goals. And it's sort of, again, flip all this focus. And when goals are clear, you know where we put our attention. What am I focusing on now? What am I focusing on next? And when we write up clear goals lists, like a daily to do list, it's a good clear goals list. That also lowers cognitive load. All the crap you're thinking about at any one point. Right. If I lower cognitive load, I liberate some energy that your brain will automatically repurpose for attention. So again, this clear goals acts as a flow trigger. But one of the things I tell people is when you start making a clear goals list, there's a couple rules. You usually want to start your day or your work session with your hardest task, like the biggest win. The thing that if you get through that, you've like you you've basically won your day. But and then go sort of in diminishing returns. Anything that takes energy goes on the list. But the point is this: you got to figure out how many items to max out the list on. And what the way to do that is to like run the experiment in your life for a couple of weeks, make to do lists, and see how many things can I do in a day, and be excellent at all of them. Mm. Right. The minute you're starting to get below excellent. You've got too many things on your list. And so there's a number, right? Like just nine, 12, whatever it is. And it goes up and down a little bit for all of us. But I don't try to go past that because I know I can't be excellent anymore. Like I've exhausted my energy for the day and I got to reboot and I got to recover. And so that's when I stop working. Like that's when I go, you know, do a mindfulness practice or get in the sauna or do an active recovery practice, you know, that, that yeah. sort of stuff. That's when I shut it down for the day because you have to be able to turn that anxiety off, right? You need yeah. that disengagement. Otherwise, otherwise you have burnout. Otherwise you, you're going in, you're going in the wrong direction. Got it. Last question, my friend, if you could have a billboard to get a message out to millions of people, metaphorically speaking, what would that message say? I have no idea. I really don't. But people ask me, and I never, I never know what to say. The only thing I, the, where I fumble to often on this one is, is sort of what 30 years of, of, of studying, you know, what is impossible and, and, and being around people who have done it over and over, and over again. The thing yeah. I always, I, like nobody I met who has accomplished the impossible, who did something truly extraordinary, started out extraordinary. Hmm. They just started out like you and me. Right. The only thing they did is like there's peak performance, it's like six things you do every day and seven things you do every week, today, tomorrow, right? Four percent plus four percent plus four percent. That's the difference. That's the only that that's really the only difference as far as I can tell. So that's that's the thing. That's the thing that I always I don't know how you put that on a billboard, but if you were to sum it up, I we're all capable of so much more than we know. Right. No, I love it. That's well said. And I think we lose sight of that too. We see the extraordinary and we think those folks were just gifted or blessed, but that was a long road to get there. It's well, also the most fun road. Mm-hmm. Is the other th- I mean, right. Like that's, that's the other thing. And it sounds really crazy, but like, I, I don't get the point of trying to do something. If you can't, if you're not trying to be best in the world at it. I mean, I'm not saying you're <laughs> going to be best in the world. You know what I mean? Like, I do. No, I of course it. you're going to get your ass kicked, but like, fuck, you get one shot at this life. Mm hmm. You know, I want to make it count at least. Like, that's the one thing I know for sure. I get. I want to make the with little I have. I want to make it count. I love it. I love it, man. I know you got to get out of here. I appreciate your time. That is our our most valuable asset. So I appreciate you sharing it with me and the listeners today. And keep doing what Thanks you're doing, so my friend. Thank you, Stephen.